Um, so Q&A with PNJ is a project of Preservation New Jersey that seeks to highlight voices across the preservation community, uh, bring their knowledge and expertise on a wide variety of preservation topics to the public. This session will be an hour. We will have a Q&A for you, uh, the audience, at the end for the last 15 minutes. Um, and we do, you know, we do really value networking. Again, we're not going to be doing networking uh, all of us uh, speaking our names today, but it would be nice to know who's in the room with us. Uh, and so you can all put your name and if, uh, if applicable affiliation in the chat. Uh, my name is Emily Manns. I'm the executive director of Preservation New Jersey. And uh, we have a speaker today who is our the president of our board at Preservation New Jersey. So we're excited to welcome Barton Ross. Um, Barton is a preservation architect and city planner who's contributed to master plans for the Virginia State Capitol and the U.S. Uh, Capitol, as well as Princeton University. Um, he is the managing principal of Barton Ross and Partners. He's on the board of directors at the preservation of, of the Chesapeake Bay chapter of AIA. Um, and he's a graduate of Columbia University. And he has a master's degree in historic preservation from the University of Pennsylvania. So I'm going to, I'm not going to, don't hold on, I'm just going to mute everybody. Oops. Okay. So I'm not going to kind of go too far into what he's going to be talking about today. He has a beautiful presentation uh, prepared for you. But um, again, feel free as you come into the room, introduce yourself in the chat. I want to leave a lot of time for his presentation today. He's going to cover a lot of topics. Um, and feel free if you want to ask a question in the chat um, as we get started as well. So there will be again time for us to all kind of vocalize and, and voice our questions at the end, but it'd be great to have some of those questions in the chat and I'll make note of them and make sure we return to them. So with that, I'll ask Barton to share his screen and get started. All right, thank you, Emily. I hope uh, everyone can hear me very well. I'll we try can. to speak loudly and clearly, okay. <laughs> All right, can everyone see the presentation? Good. All right, terrific. So, um, <clears throat> so yeah, today uh, we wanted to cover like historic preservation standards and using appropriate building materials. Um, you know, I help out a lot of municipalities with their historic preservation commissions. So, I kind of wanted to run through, you know, a lot of the the issues and some things we've seen in towns and kind of give you a few best practices, um, you know, for how. Historic Preservation Commissions have handled a few things, especially with regard to, um, you know, using appropriate building materials. So with that, I'm probably going to walk through, um, you know, kind of some of the, the background of preservation, especially for your local commission in New Jersey. And then I'm going to try to tie it to the 10 uh, standards from um, Secretary of Interior standards. And then we'll show some examples of how that actually uh, plays out. So starting with the legal basis for historic preservation. So I was, I'm sure some of you can recognize this. This is Pennsylvania Station in New York City. So this is where Madison Square Garden is today. But this used to be the entrance when you came up uh, from the trains into New York City. And this is a beautiful Beaux-Arts building designed by McKim, Mead and White. And this was a really prominent historic presence uh, as you came into New York City. And when this was torn down in 1963, this was really kind of the impetus for um, historic preservation regulation in the United States. Um, and that came with the National Historic Preservation Act a couple years later in 1966, uh, followed very closely behind by the uh, Landmark Preservation Commission in New York City. So this created, this act created the 59 state uh, historic preservation offices and the tribal offices. And this identified for the first time the National Register of Historic Places, which is our national listing of historic, uh, you know, significant properties in the United States. It created the Certified Local Government Program. The Section 106 review process, which would be today if like New Jersey Transit was undertaking a project or, uh, you know, a highway was coming through, anything that's involving that government money, let's FCC, uh, cell tower installation, all of that, uh, falls under section 106. We have the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, which oversees uh, government responsibilities at the national level. And then section 110 was implemented, which is federal agency stewardship uh, for historic properties that they control. And think of this as like the GSA, which is the largest property owner uh, in the United States.
United States. So historic preservation was tested in 1978 with Penn Central uh, case, which went all the way to the Supreme Court. It's the only preservation law case ever decided by the Supreme Court and probably will, will be the only one ever decided. So as you see on the left here, this is Grand Central Station in New York City. So we'd already lost you know, the Penn Station. And Marcel Brewer, the famous architect, proposed this uh, you know, modern skyscraper to go above uh, the station. And this was not allowed by the Landmarks Preservation Commission in New York City. So they appealed it all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court found that it wasn't a taking by denying them the right to build this uh, because they have a transfer of development rights possibility where they could sell the air rights above the station. And so that's what they did. So this historic preservation wasn't depriving them of full monetary use of their property. And so this enabled all future public regulation of historic properties in the United States to be legal. So what's in a historic preservation ordinance? So we want to protect historic properties, but we also have to recognize not everything's historic, even if it's old. But let's say you do have lots of things that are historic um, in New Jersey. The municipal land use law, and this is a, an annotated version. It's about a 10 page PDF that the Historic Preservation Office has on their website. And it's a very good overview of how historic preservation ordinances work within the municipal land use law. Uh, you know, what are the powers of the planning board, the zoning board of adjustment and the Historic Preservation Commission and how do they work together? It's a very good document. So in New Jersey, all historic preservation commissions and their ordinance should date from the 1985 amendments to the municipal land use law. So in New Jersey, we find a lot of ordinances when this came out in 1985 were immediately null and void. So most ordinances have had to be rewritten uh, to reflect the 85 amendments. So the governing body has to establish the ordinance. The planning board may act as an HPC in small towns. And by small towns, we mean 2,500 people or less. You can have uh, five, seven, or nine regular members. They serve four-year terms. They're appointed by the mayor in most cases. You select up to alternate, uh, two alternate members who serve two-year terms. And the HPC selects their own chair, vice chair, and designates the secretary, usually uh, at the first meeting of the year. So I always like to show people this. What are the duties of historic preservation commissions? And this is, these are the duties. So if you, you know, learn nothing else, know this. Uh, historic preservation commissions are supposed to prepare surveys of historic sites in your municipality. They make recommendations to the planning board on inclusion of master plan elements. These are potentially historic properties in your town. They advise the planning board and zoning board on development applications, which involve historic sites that are said listed already in the historic preservation element of your master plan. And they provide written reports to the construction officer or the planning board regarding permit applications. This would be like your certificate of appropriateness. And they perform advisory, educational, and other informational functions that promote historic preservation uh, in the municipality. So local preservation ordinances, this is the only way to regulate privately owned historic properties in the United States. Um, and this is what you actually need in your ordinance, your statement of purpose, why are you creating the HPC, you need criteria and procedures for designation, what's reviewable by your HPC, uh, criteria and procedures for review. Do they report to the um, construction official or to the planning board? You know, procedures for appeal, enforcement provisions, violations, and then demolition control. So all of this needs to be somewhat spelled out in your ordinance. In New Jersey, we have two types of ordinance. So there's the strong commission, that's where the HPC does their CAs and they report directly to the construction official and he has to follow what the HPC said. A weak commission is where the HPC reports to the planning board who then makes their own decision. So basically a weak commission um, you know, has advisory uh, role. Um, and this, this is different from town to town, um, how, how much the HPC really has a role uh, and what's said, but you know, it's, it's better to have a weak commission, obviously, than no commission at all. Certificate of appropriateness. So in the application review process, owners of locally designated sites and districts must get approval from a locally appointed historic preservation commission for major exterior alterations, additions, and new construction. And the commission approval is typically in the form of a certificate of appropriateness or a CA. To be approved an application for um, you know, 
approval must meet the design review criteria within the preservation ordinance that your municipality adopted. So you can't just say, I like this, I don't like this. You always want to try to, uh, you know, tie it to real, you know, text of the criteria, how you're reviewing it, which should be in your ordinance. Certified local government grants. So there are currently 46 CLGs in the state of New Jersey, and these are eligible for uh, funding from the Historic Preservation Office, which is trickle down funding from the National Park Service for various planning type of projects in your municipality. So you can see the list there and it's an involved application process uh, as you try to get certified. But it's an important thing to do. So reference standards. So you have your design guidelines in your town. Your Ordinance should reference the Secretary of Interior standards and other common sense principles that emphasize preservation of historic character, repair over replacement, and compatibility of alterations. So something that was implemented recently that some of you may or may not be aware of, um, effective March 5th, 2018, the DCA basically took out a lot of maintenance because it was a real pain for some towns and municipalities to have their own inspectors go out and review everything. So now a lot that would have required a, a construction permit in the past does not. This includes windows, doors, sidings, uh, roofing, some insulation, gutters, um, you know, porches that don't involve foundation work. So uh, obviously painting. You need to be aware of this because sometimes we found that, um, you know, even though the Historic Preservation Commission obviously needs a CA or some other type of approval for all this, uh, the, they may go to the town and, you know, the construction department says, well, you don't need a permit. So, you know, you can, good luck and be on your way. So it's, it's important that vigilance is key and you keep, you keep on top of this. The state historic preservation obviously can help. Uh, in New Jersey, we call it the HPO. They maintain the national and state registers, uh, the regulatory reviews, such as for New Jersey Transit or other government uh, agencies. They administer the CLG program the State Historic Preservation Plan, and they provide technical assistance to New Jersey residents. Um, so that they're an excellent resource. In New Jersey, we also have the Uniform Construction Code Re Rehabilitation Subcode, which won a lot of awards. It's a really neat program um, and document. And you know, I, I always show like this example. So basically, if you're eligible or listed um, on the state or national register, you can get a lot of exemptions for your historic property. And this is a, a perfect example. A lot of people want on their porch, you know, let's say their the railings and balusters are falling apart. They want to put in new railings and, you know, you, we want you to do wood railings to match. Great. But currently residential code is 36 inches, commercial codes 42 inches, whereas a lot of these were built 28 to 30 inches once upon a time. So as long as you're repairing or replacing in kind, you can stay at that 28 or 30 inches, whatever it exists, and you don't actually have to bring it up to code. So it's a, it's a wonderful document if you know how to use it. So what is significant? Um, you know, this is very important as you, you apply your national register criteria and try to adopt it also in your local town. Um, and there's the three requirements to qualify for the National Register of Historic Places. Um, and these include significance and evaluation, considerations for age and type of your property, and most important, these seven aspects of integrity, location, design, setting, materials, workmanship, feeling, and association. So I encourage everyone to reread National Register Bulletin 15 and apply these criteria to your local review process uh, to eliminate subjectivity when you're giving out CAs or approvals in your town. So the philosophical principles in the Secretary of Interior standards have been proven to be important in the successful administration of local historic districts. Typically, they are either directly cited within a preservation ordinance or used as the basis for development of a local design guideline. So historic character refers to all the visual aspects and physical features of a historic building, including its uh, size, scale, building, materials, detail, craftsmanship, uh, et cetera. By following the standards, change to significant features and spaces can be minimized and the building's long-term preservation can be achieved. So there are um, four ways that the uh, Secretary of Interior uh, classifies you know, what you're going to undertake on your building. 
Preservation generally focuses on the ongoing maintenance and repair of historic materials and features rather than extensive replacement and new construction. The limited and sensitive upgrading of systems and other code required works to make these properties functional is appropriate within a preservation project. However, uh, new exterior additions are not usually covered by this. And here's a good example from Williamsburg. Rehabilitation is probably the most common that we use. It means a return of a property to a useful condition while repairing and retaining those elements that are significant while making necessary upgrades for it to function in the 21st century. So in rehabilitation, you might repair the significant, uh, albeit deteriorated porch, but remove and replace the old inefficient furnace. So in other words, rehabilitations take place in the real world in buildings that have to function now, uh, not just to be admired or used as museums. And the rehabilitation standards acknowledge the need to alter or add to these historic buildings to meet continuing uses. Here's a good example uh, in Montclair on Bloomfield Avenue where we're able to completely restore all the terracotta, yet uh, you can see on the sign bands, uh, we tried to do an innovative system, which is shown in this detail on the right. So every time that these tenants come and go, they're not drilling into the terracotta and making holes that, that then need to be replaced. They're only uh, replacing their sign drilling into the, the, the actual metal uh, fabric that's been provided on the sign band. So this was a, a nice way to eliminate a problem of water intrusion that had been going on at this building. So restoration, it's common for these terms to sometimes get confused, but restoration is to return a building to its appearance at a particular period of time. It can involve the removal of later additions, which of course happened here at James Madison's house, uh, Montpelier. Um, this approach is generally used for museum properties or properties of very great significance. Uh, the restoration standards allow for the depiction of a building at a particular period in its history by preserving materials, features, finishes from that period and removing all of it. So that's what happened here. They removed all the DuPont uh, additions when the DuPont family owned it in the late 1800s and they returned, they tried to restore it exactly back to how it would have been in 1814 when James Madison was president. Reconstruction is uh, the active process of depicting by means of new construction, the form features and detailing of a non-surviving uh, site landscape building structure or object. And this is for the purpose of replicating its appearance at a specific period of time and in a historic location. And the Palace of Fine Arts, you know, you can see it was, it was built of like paper mache. So it was really only meant to be um, up for a very brief period of time, but everyone loved it in San Francisco. So they decided to, uh, you know, expertly recreate it. And that's reconstruction. Now there's also relocation. Now this is really when a property is very significant or associated with a historic person or event. And you know this used to happen more obviously in the 50s, 60s and 70s when you didn't have to move power lines and pay you know, Verizon and Comcast you know, crazy rates to move power lines and everything or obstructions that were in the way. But you know, this is a form of saving a historic property especially when the building is gonna be torn down which in this case, this was the home of a governor in Maryland that we worked on a preservation plan for and the building was able to be saved and moved to a new site. Adaptive reuse. This is Hillside Square in Montclair, which was once a, a church built in the 1920s. And to add offices into it, they basically cut the nave in half. So now you have a lower and an upper level. But people love it. They love the light. They love the history of it. Um, and this has been a very successful adaptive reuse project. Uh, there's also resilience and um, vulnerability to flooding and other uh, issues that go on when you, you're located near the water, such as Farnsworth House, which is located right on the floodplain of a river. And this was designed by Mies van der Rohe in 1951. It's owned by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And they've come up with an innovative way of um, kind of mechanically uh, raising and lowering the building that they're working on to, to try to mitigate this. And as, as many of you know from Hurricane Sandy, this was a big deal in New Jersey as well. So the Secretary of Interior Standards, there's 10 of them. Standard one, a property shall be used for its historic purpose or place in a new use that requires minimal change to the defining characteristics of a building, its site and environment, loft apartments and office spaces are two contemporary adaptive uses that retain and reuse a building's character defining features yet allow for modern functions such as apartments. It's a great use of old warehouse buildings. I'm sure many of you have seen that before. It's a basic preservation philosophy that underscores the importance of assuring a good fit between the old and the new. 
Standard two, the new work respects and preserves the building's historic character, the removal of historic materials or alterations of features and spaces that characterize a property shall be avoided. Um, we, this is the Corbin building in New York City, which was part of the Fulton Street Transit Center, uh, complete redevelopment. Um, and you know, this was once the tallest building in the world when it was constructed in 1889, and it's owned by the MTA. And you know, good for them, they paid to restore it. And I had a chance to work on this project where we, we literally cleaned and repaired and uh, preserved all the character defining features in the building. And you can see there, there was a lot of them. And this building has a new life now. These are some more examples of uh, retaining historic properties and their character defining features. So on the left, this is the crane block in Montclair where we were able to, to save all the history, but rehabilitate the first floor uh, commercial units and provide a sign band. And this has been very successful. And um, you know, we eliminated some of the colors and tried to uh, restore the red brick. And on the right, this is a project in Plainfield, an 1830s house where a developer came in and, and wanted to put uh, this addition on the top. And this is absolutely what you do not do. And this is not retaining and preserving uh, the historic integrity of the property. So standard three, each property um, shall be recognized as a physical record of its time, place, and use. Changes that uh, reflect uh, you know, the architectural and conjectural features, elements from other buildings should not be removed. Standard three warns against attempting to recreate an earlier or false historic appearance. So on the left, we have a 19th century commercial building. And down the street, a similar building has been altered. So they were once the same, but these added details create a false historic appearance and diminish the building's character. So when adding or restoring missing features, be sure their design materials and placement are based on good documentation, such as historic photos, drawings, accounts, or physical evidence. We don't wanna create this false sense of history by, by trying to add these historic features that uh, were never there before. Now, that being said, this is a property in downtown Montclair. This is now a Lululemon, as you see on the bottom, but it was an appliance store. This is a non-contributing property in the historic district. Obviously it had no architectural defining features that anybody wanted to save, but we were able to add some details to this building, um, trying not to create a false sense of history, but to blend it in with the rest of the uh, neighborhood character. And so I think this was a successful example of um, you know, going a little sideways from the standards, but trying to make you know, it work for everyone involved in the project. So standard four recognizes that buildings change over time and that some additions may be significant. For example, the Hampton House's Art Deco facade makeover in 1949 was applied over an 1890 uh, brick facade, but its architecture has gained significance in its own right because of its uh, modern uh, architectural design. So you can see there on the top left what it used to look like, and, and now you see the modern interpretation of it, which you know has its own significance, and we, we want to preserve that, and the HPC does, does do that. The storefront on the right demonstrates a high level of craftsmanship, and this is a good example of an art deco design on a small-scale commercial building. So this, again, is worthy of preservation uh, because of its uh, Art Deco associations. So it's kind of a, a judgment call and that's why you have a statement of significance or some, some kind of a survey on record for all buildings uh, under HPC control. So standard five asks that we treat distinctive stylistic features with sensitivity. So this uh, distinctive uh, stylistic uh, portico here, although deteriorated, was carefully repaired and preserved as part of the overall rehabilitation. In a positive example, the owner repaired these historic windows, uh, repairing the sound fabric and selectively replacing missing or heavily deteriorated trim pieces. You can see there on the windows and everything. So uh, the cornice as well. And here's an example of how not to do that. So this is a 1722 house and you can see there, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it has the distinctive 1722 in the glazed headers on the brick end. And those are the glaze headers right there. And you can see the chimneys match. Those are the historic chimneys. And basically that's where it all falls apart. So the, the, this addition done to this house does not uh, you know, qualify for the Secretary of Interior standards. And this is really just a poor job. Now, the only thing 
That being said is you could always apply restoration to this and try to restore it at a future date. I mean, the building is in there somewhere. So, but um, this is an example of why we have HPCs and try to avoid things like this. Standard six, replacement of missing features shall be substantiated by documentary, physical, or pictorial evidence. So it's important to retain as much historic fabric as possible. When too much is replaced, historic character is lost. So no doubt the neighbor on the right needs work, but repairing the wood siding, windows, and trim will help preserve its original character and significance. And obviously you can see the one on the left with its vinyl siding and vinyl windows. Uh, it's kind of, if it's lost all its window trim, door trim, so that's what we're trying to avoid. And here's another example of that. So let's say you have an existing slate roof. Uh, they usually last 100 plus years. Obviously, it's very expensive. So we do not want an incompatible slate substitute. We want an asphalt shingle that actually mimics that. And in the historic districts, we actually do allow this on a case by case basis if it, uh, if it really makes sense. We usually try to get people to repair their slate roof. But if it's just cost prohibitive, there are good slate substitutes out there. So standard seven, this could be called the thou shall not sandblast standard. So the building on the right is suffering from acid burn as a result of the use of incorrect, uh, you know, of application of hydrochloric acid. You can see all the, the color staining. Obviously it's not good for the environment. So we really do not like people to sandblast uh, any brick structure. And here's an example. Uh, this again is on Bloomfield Avenue. This is an example of how we, we tried to bring that back using yawn casting mortar and you know trying to repoint the brick but blend it in a way. You can see it has kind of the acid burn as well, but we were able to, um, to kind of restore it back to its, its more original appearance with a more modern um, you know, storefront. So this, this was a good example of using the gentlest means possible to, to try to bring something back. Standard eight is significant archaeological resources which are affected by a project. These should be protected and preserved. If such resources must be disturbed, mitigation measures should be undertaken. So what we do not see can be just as important or even more important than what we do see, especially when you're trying to understand the chronology or evolution of a building or structure and how it, how it evolved over time. And this is a project I worked on in the Bronx in New York, the banknote factory, which is where they printed money once upon a time. And when we were rehabilitating this building, we found all these different uh, machines and industrial equipment. And rather than get rid of it or hide it, we, we tried to celebrate it. So we repainted it and you know, reused it as part of the aesthetic of the, the building's rehabilitation. So I think the most important advice when attempting to rehabilitate an older building is not to rush into anything. You know, do your research, your homework before starting the project. Get to know your building, learn its history by locating historic photos, and investigate to determine its construction history and prepare a preservation plan so you can kind of um, plan to do something like this. So standard nine is new additions, exterior alterations, or new construction should not destroy historic materials. It should be differentiated from the old, but still compatible with the massing, size, scale, and architectural features to protect the historic integrity of the property and its environment. This new redevelopment project is compatible with, but it does not duplicate the neighboring buildings in the historic district. The materials, massing, storefronts, awnings, and fenestration are contemporary, yet they're compatible in their design. And standard 10, this is the last standard, new additions and adjacent or related new construction shall be undertaken in such a manner that if removed in the future, the essential form and integrity of the historic property and its environment would not be uh, impaired. And so these, these are three examples. Um, this is a, a commercial building where is, if you look there on the above the building, this actually there was a fire here at this building. So you can see these are window sills on the left there. And this was a, a theater at one time. They lost the third story. But then we did this uh, step back third story that has a modern zinc facade. But you don't really see it from the street and it kind of blends in. So that's the idea. Um, actually, that has good views of New York City from that location. So that's a, a, a well-placed addition to the building. And on the right are two examples of farmhouses where additions were put on, but they used a, a hyphen, which is a smaller uh, connecting structure. So in the future, you can always take off the hyphen, hyphens or remove them, but you still understand what the original massing of the historic structure was. And that's always important to try to do. So appropriate building materials. 
So historic roof underlayment. You have space purlins, solid decking. These, these type of things want to be restored or preserved in kind. Um, on the left, uh, the spaced purlins are, are really you know, used on wood construction. And that was so the, the wood shingles and everything could breathe. Um, and this was all done throughout the 17 and 1800s. And really, when you're trying to do a wood roof, you don't want to do a plywood with a cedar breather. You want to try to put the purlins back. And we do this often. And then we do triple coverage with the wood shingles. And it, it works really well. On the right is more your late 1800s, early 1900s construction, where they actually went to solid decking. And you basically just replace these boards in kind. And this usually is for your slate roofs or your tile roofs that were popular um, in the Victorian times up until World War II. And then obviously after World War II, it's, it's pretty much plywood on most of them. So the Cedar Bureau puts out uh, excellent uh, articles and guidelines to follow specifications. Um, and you know they come in many different types, but this explains the details and it's very helpful for architects like me to, to do it the right way. And you can see on the lower right is actually shakes. Shakes are very thick. And most people use shingles, they're, they're cheaper. But the point is, whichever one you use, that um, the exposures are, they have enough redundancy. So you triple cover it or even quadruple cover it. So then if you know, your shakes start to wear thin, that there's redundancy under it because you don't have plywood or anything. And you don't obviously want any leaks. So, so that's really the point with doing a wood roof. And then slate roofs. Slate roofs are very heavy, but they last over 100 years. Um, but usually at the end of their 100 years, they look like this on the upper left. You know, you have many slates missing. You got the pigeons up here. This building sat like this for so long, it's actually an African-American church that we had to do this detail to catch, uh, you know, the bird excrement that comes off the roof. So that's what that detail is there. And we actually had to install that for years until they were able to raise enough money to put uh, a new slate roof on, which cost almost $200,000. But you can see here, you know, it came out beautiful, all copper gutters, um, and the birds found a new home. You know, they, I think they moved a couple doors down where the roof was falling apart. So, so everything worked out in the end. But remember, if you're doing a slate roof, that the structure underneath, especially if it's wood structure, should have always been designed to have that slate roof. Uh, you know, I, we often find, find times where it was a wood roof originally and people put slate on because it looked nice in the early 1900s. And now the whole roof is falling apart because it's just too much weight on that structure. And asphalt shingle roofing has, has really come a long way. This is GAF slate line, um, you know, certain Teed, Cambridge, they all have some good products now that we allow in historic districts. And, you know, when it costs $200,000 to replace your slate roof on a structure like this, you know, I, I think a lot of the historic commissions, especially in their design guidelines, should have some alternative materials uh, for the roofing. And, you know, it could be a premium asphalt shingle or something nice, but, um, you know, there should be alternatives because, you know, when, it, when it's between putting a $200,000 roof on or just saving the building, obviously, you know, in some of these instances, we, the roof is the most important thing to keep the water out of the building. This is the uh, Short Hills train station where we put new roof on and we um, actually found the exact type of roof that was put on um, over 100 years ago, a French interlocking tile. They even come with 75 year warranty. You can see the solid decking there on the left and that's actually what it looked like before we put the, the new roof on. Um, and Ludovicki makes these, these wonderful tiles. They aren't inexpensive, I will say. This was a, a couple hundred thousand dollars as well, but uh, you know, the municipality paid for it. And it came out beautiful and they get a warranty with it. So hopefully this outlives uh, you know, all of us on this call and uh, will continue to be preserved for years to come. So a lot of wood details, you know, you can't really, you know, I can't Google wood details and really find some of these integral Yankee type gutters or, you know, how things used to be built with the cornices and the trim. So we often refer back to the books that were published in the 1910s and 20s and 30s. And, you know, there's some really good volumes out there and they actually show these details. And sometimes it's the only place you can find these details without you getting up and doing all your measured drawings yourself. So these are an incredible resource. I think a lot of people should invest in these, um, in these books, uh, especially if you're doing detailing on historic projects or you're just trying to understand um, how they put it together. I, I use these with contractors as well to kind of show them the best way to approach it. 
And on the lower left is something we do with uh, really old buildings when they don't have a gutter. You, if you don't have a, you know, a gutter at the roof, you definitely need a perimeter gutter around the bottom. And we use oyster shell sometimes, or we do uh, a drain tile covered by these, um, these brick swales and they work really well. All right, so roofing, this is, this is these are all things we just never wanna see. These are all just bad. So um, at the upper right, you, you have three tab shingles. So we never like three tab shingles. You always use an architectural shingle, especially in historic districts. Um, the three tab are really the cheapest and you can see they really fall apart like 20 years or less. Uh, the top left, you can see there the gutter straps are you know, holding the gutter are actually stapled on top of the roof shingles. So we never like that. We always tell people you've got to put your gutter straps underneath the shingles so we don't see it. And on the lower, lower right, um, you know, you've got to clean your gutters, obviously. Gutters got to be cleaned. And also you can see that that's a K gutter. And I'll show you on the next slide. We try to prohibit people from doing K gutters. Um, I know, you know, my, my house has a K gutter. That's a modern house. But, you know, historic houses, we don't, we don't use it. So what we usually try to get people to do is a half round um, with a circle class every 32 inches and a round or corrugated leader. So uh, remember though, when you do this, that uh, rounded gutters need at least an inch more than a K gutter. So if you have a five inch K gutter, you need a six inch half round gutter, just because of the shape, uh, it needs that, that space to be able to hold as much water. And you can just put a perforated metal screen on top, just like you would a K gutter. And you know, they look a lot more historic and they work just as well when installed properly. And you know, obviously they come in aluminum, copper, lead coated copper, zinc coated copper, uh, you know, galvanized uh, metal, we use, we use all of them. So wood exterior siding is sustainable. I, I don't know that everyone knows, but uh, you know, that's Mount Vernon there on the right. And Mount Vernon is not made of stone. Mount Vernon is made of wood. It is wood made to look like stone. And then it, it was um, sandblasted or in, impregnated with sand to give it that rough texture. And it's been preserved all these years. You keep a fresh coat of paint on it and wood will survive forever. If, if it's not, uh, you know, the elements aren't allowed to get into it and, and work their, you know, destructive power on it. Um, on the left are some images of something I like to do on um, really old houses, you know, pre-1820 houses. You get this brick nogging construction where they have the, the wood uh, members there, the girts at the side and the, the corners, and then they filled in brick. So brick has no R value. It has maybe like 0.5 R value. But they did it, the colonists and the early Americans put this brick in because it, it, it helped against racking and sheer structural and lateral forces. So it kind of helped ground the house and keep it from moving, especially when it's a wood structure. And that's how some of these houses have survived so long. Um, you know, they just look like wood clapboard and their wood structure, but they have all this brick to kind of uh, hold them in place with their weight. And this is West Marine System, so it's an epoxy. And so, you know, I never like to rip stuff out, especially when it's 200 years old. So we often use this uh, epoxy to kind of fill in the wood and then it's, it, it hardens and it's good as new and you didn't have to take out the wood. Um, preservation brief. So according to the National Park Service, four circumstances warrant the consideration of substitute materials. The unavailability of historic materials, the unavailability of skilled craftsmen, inherent flaws in the original materials, code required changes, which in many cases can be extremely destructive of historic resources. So cost may or not, may not be a factor in determining when you use substitute materials, but there's a, there's a preservation brief, which is very good. And you can see on the left, I don't even like to use preservation, uh, you know, new materials if possible. You can see this is wood siding. And if you just go to the lumber yard, you can see how much thinner it is nowadays than when you've got the old growth lumber to begin with. So it's just less material for your money now. It doesn't last as long. Uh, you know, if it's in good shape and it could be repaired or repainted, I always advise to use it. Now, that being said, a lot of people nowadays like to use, uh, you know, hardy plank or some kind of cement uh, board. And we found that the, the board and batten type on the, the right, uh, you know, really doesn't look good when it's done. It just doesn't look historic. Uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago, people kept proposing this. It just doesn't look right. And also on the lower left, we, we try to discourage people from using the grain, uh, you know, edge uh, to it because it just looks fake and, and plastic. So we always tell them you can use cement board, especially if it's an addition or a new building. We never let them use it on historic buildings. But if it's a, 
a new building, we allow it if it's field painted and it's the smooth board, and then it's often not as noticeable. So here you, you see some examples. And if you field apply the paint and use real mitered corners sometimes or a real corner board, uh, you can see you know, it doesn't look that bad. So on the lower left there, you can see that has the wood grain and it's not field painted, so it just doesn't look good. Masonry facades. So we often find that when people go to repoint masonry facades, they don't use hand tools. They just go out there with their grinder and start making just a mess of everything. And what happens is, uh, you can see it here in some of the images, they basically cut into the brick and now your mortar joint, which may, may have been a butter joint or a very thin joint once upon a time, is now a thick joint. And that's absolutely what we do not want. Um, and we always tell people to use lime mortars and lime mortars, you can get it tested now. They come in these little you know, strips that you can test. And there's one place outside of Philadelphia that's the only place in the United States that you can get NHL lime mortars, which are the naturally hydraulic lime mix. And they come in, they come in basically mixes. So it makes the mason's job easier now. So I recommend everybody try to make people uh, use lime mortars and not use uh, Portland cement, which is very hard. And Portland cement makes the brick basically fall apart over time because that mortar is harder than the, the actual um, brick itself. So in the old days, as everyone knows, there was no control joints. So each little brick kind of acted as its own control joint with its lime mortar around it. And here's some more examples. Um, the lower right, uh, we have more yawn casting mortar when people are redoing signs to eliminate those holes that are in it. And the top right, we have, um, this is actually the Wellmont Theater in Montclair that had to get repointed and we weren't sure that we'd be able to find bricks that were 100 years old to match this very unique brick. And we, we discovered that the bricks, because of their records, were done by Belden Brick Company in Ohio. So we called up Belden Brick Company. We said, hey, I'm going to send you a sample of some brick you did you know, 100 years ago. And after they got it, they said, oh, yeah, we, we still have that mold out in the yard somewhere. So they went out and got it, and they remade us the bricks. So um, you know, sometimes if you do your homework on a historic preservation project, that's you know, is the kind of the fortuitous things that you can find. Um, porches, this is another one we deal with a lot. Obviously, when you're doing a wood porch with all these decorative details, you really have to keep the paint on and keep restoring them. But when people are doing new porches, we allow HB and G, which are fiberglass. And again, as long as they're field painted, um, you know, they look great. Nobody ever complains. And we pretty much universally, we, we now allow these in all the historic districts that I work in. Doors and windows. Um, this is another one. We obviously try to get people to restore their original doors and windows, but if they don't, we always allow simulated divided light with the spacer bar, which is the uh, top one here. And then we also allow um, authentic or true divided light, which is how they used to build it. We definitely do not allow grills between the glass or the plastic snap on grills. So we, we try to keep people away from that. And you can see here that you know repairing your old wood windows is, is really the best course of action. And as long as you keep paint on wood, uh, it lasts forever. It's really, it's when the paint gets off the wood and they aren't being maintained or looked at and water's infiltrating, that's when they break down. Uh, this is my uh, childhood house that we, I recently helped a family member restore. And we replaced uh, the windows, which uh, were not original. Obviously, they were they were put in the early 1900s. So we restored them back to the six over six and nine over six. They were originally all wood, and we protected the historic door and transom with these outer doors, and put a new appropriate porch on. And also, I highlight that you know the old windows were single pane, and you know if you're doing new windows, you can do double pane. But if you're trying to restore the old windows that are single pane. There's two ways you can do it. You can do storm windows on the outside, but most people don't like that look because it kind of detracts from the historic appearance. And so there's a company, Indo, that makes these really neat inserts on the inside. And that's something like Williamsburg and places use. And you know people love it because uh, you know it's on the inside. You don't see it from the outside. It serves its purpose. It cuts down on energy costs. So it's really great. This is great. So Barton, I just want to signal. So we have about 10 minutes left. I just want to make sure we have time for Q&A. Um, I know, I know there's a, so much content. I'm like trying to take notes <laughs> on, on all, all the things we're covering. I just want to make sure that, that we do have the 10 minutes at the end for, for question and answer. So just wanted to yep. bring that up. Okay. Almost done. Awesome. Um, 
Yeah, I know it's a lot. Uh, <laughs> so these are uh, fences in historic districts. And you can see on the left, these are all the type of fences we allow, the uh, you know, picket, the uh, split rail, uh, metal fences that resemble historic, even aluminum fences that, that look historic are all fine. The ones on the right, chain link and vinyl are the two, obviously in your design guidelines, you should discourage in your local historic district. Um, and this is an article I wrote a few years ago when the League of Municipalities actually devoted an entire um, uh, monthly uh, booklet to historic preservation around the state. And I was able to write an article on behalf of preservation in New Jersey, um, which was good. So, you know, historic preservation is really a catalyst that gives physical places their cultural identity and helps promote a sense of local pride and stewardship for future generations. It's a tool that can be used to substantially contribute to the continued quality of life and economic vitality in New Jersey. So with that, I will wrap it up. So, and I'd gladly take any questions. Awesome, thank you. So does anybody have any questions? I know there was a, a lot of information we covered. Uh, one thing Barton and I have talked about and we just haven't uh, been able to do yet. PNJ is very uh, small staff, but we're we're trying to grow in the next couple of years is, is break this down right into some sort of uh, more programs because there's there's a ton of information to cover and I think it's relevant for all of us. So um, any have any questions people have, even if it's specific to your um, if you want to, yep, I can see the hands um, and you can also uh, drop it in the chat. So uh, I see Elizabeth Barrett and then I see uh, Mary Ellen afterwards. Okay, Elizabeth, let me unmute you. Yep. Okay. okay. Uh, Bart, when you get into historic preservation and you're working off a very a national historic landmark, can you replace the windows? I mean, we can rebuild some of them, but most of them are now so rotted with all the ropes and everything else that is there a really good restoration window out there that somebody makes that is a, sort of a replica? Because this is a working building and we need we need the the airflow so how do we do this yes so the national park service does let you replace um windows when they're really bad um and the, the problem with window and door guys you know i they're almost like uh you know i don't want to say but you know sometimes they're like used car salesmen how they try to push stuff on you so you really have to do your homework which one's which i think getting an all wood window Obviously, simulated divided light with the spacer bar or the true divided light are the first things. They're not going to come with the rope and pulleys, although you could always pay to do that. There are still places that will basically hand make a window, but it can cost, you know, almost $5,000 a window. Yeah. So it's more economical to do, you know, like there's, you know, like a Marvin ultimate double hung or, you know, there's, there's a lot of different options out there that uh, maybe cost $1,000 a window or $800 a window but they're all wood windows and you can do true divide light. But sometimes you lose out on some of the, you know, the, the detailing, you know, it's just hard to replicate unless you actually did a custom window. <laughs> That's the thing, you know, do you have money to do a custom? It's gonna cost many thousands of dollars or do you just want an off the shelf uh, window that from a distance looks historic and it is all wood, which is what most people in historic districts do. But, you know, if you're doing, you know, James Madison's Montpelier, you're obviously gonna spend the 5,000 and do the rope and pulley you know, complete restoration. What about rope versus stainless steel uh, up and down pulleys? Uh, yeah, I mean, they're, those are both the historic ways um, to do it. So they, people still do both. They, they fix them. They also uh, manufacture them, but they're getting harder and harder to find uh, and they, they're getting more and more expensive. So most people, honestly, they just want the... Um, you know, basically on the rails, uh, you know, you can get, you know, there's like vinyl strips that the windows go up and down on, but there's ways now that with the um, wood, they can hide all that. So you just got to go through all that with your window rep. But yes, there are ways to kind of mitigate the, the modern appearance of your windows. Okay, thank you. And Mary Ellen, I think you had your hand up as well. Yes. Hi, Barton. It's Mary Ellen, Mary Ellen. the um, Madison Star Preservation. Two questions following up on the windows. Um, oh, you had a very elaborate screenshot up there about repairing windows. Where was that from? 
Mm, I don't know. I could send it to you. Um, okay. It's probably from my somewhere from my travels through the years. But yeah, that's a, that's a neat graphic. I agree. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask you if you well, and if you'd be willing to share your um, think about whether or not you'd be willing to share your um, slides with us. And and secondly, we are working on a project that needs lime water. Where do you? Where is the one spot in the world that you can get that? Oh. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'll email everybody the, the contact info. Yeah, maybe Emily can, can post it. Um, okay. and yeah, they're, they're great to work with. And they actually sell the bags. So you can, you can get the samples and you pick which bag you want. And it, and it comes pre-mixed. Pre so your mason's not out there with like the sand and the dirt trying to mix it himself. So it makes life great and, it, and it's lime water. So everyone appreciates it. So. Okay, do they do the work too or do you need someone else to do that? So they do not do the work. However, they have training sessions throughout the year and, and Masons go and learn from them how to do it. So it's a nice little program they have going. Great, thanks very much. It's been excellent, thank you. Thank you. Great, I saw um, a couple uh, there's a couple questions in the chat and there was also somebody who had had their hand raised here. I think um, I'm gonna go to Ted from Pensacan Historical Society and then I'll go to the ones in the chat. Go. Ted, did you still have a question? You have to unmute. Okay. Uh, I do. I, at the very end of your presentation, you mentioned that the League of Municipalities published something. Uh, and can you give me the title so I can follow up on that? Ah, uh, yes. Well, I'd have to remember which date it was from. It was from like 2017. So I ask if you ask Emily, I will, I will get you the actual date. And in fact, I think I have a PDF of the whole um, the booklet that they put out that month. So. You have a PDF? Can you send her up? I'd be glad to share it, yes. Okay. Um, and uh, we did record this, and uh, so this is always this is recorded, and I'll also compile kind of some of these documents um, and, and notes from Barton for us to share out. Uh, Ted, I think you're off mute now. Yeah, my question was just about the line mortar and where oh, it would be. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's a popular question. Okay, yeah. great. Um, next, uh, Rich Rockwell put in the chat, uh, what do you do with a historic building that has a vinyl or aluminum siding and they want to replace it with vinyl siding? Yeah, that's, that's a tough one. Um, it depends on how your ordinance is written, but normally we let people replace stuff, you know, like for like or same material for same material. So if they're already grandfathered in, you know, it's not like a violation. They put something up they shouldn't have, but if they're already grandfathered in by the time you write the ordinance and they have aluminum or vinyl siding and they want to replace it, great. But we usually use it as an opportunity to get people to, to do the right thing. So if they're just replacing it, like it's maintenance, that's that's usually tough. But let's say they're doing it as part of a, an addition or you know a porch repair that they're doing as part of the project, then we can kind of push them more. Hey, look, we'll prove this. But, but if you're replacing your siding, we want for or windows or doors even, or even roofing, we want you to use the right material. And that's usually your opportunity to push them a little bit. Great, thank you. Um, the next in the chat, Peter Primavera said he has a question. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, Barton, great job. Thanks, Emily. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yep. Um, I, one, one thing I wanted to just compliment Barton on and give everybody a little bit of clarity on is when Barton said during his presentation, we like this or we like that, what Barton is very specifically referring to is these standards that he talked about today. He's not talking about matters of taste or judgment or aesthetics. What he's doing is he's referring always to these standards that he described today. And for everybody who on an HPC, everybody doing a preservation project, I think what I just want to add to what Barton said is do your homework. Don't just come to the meeting, look at the application. You haven't done your homework. You haven't looked into what is authentic, what is realistic, what are the options, what do the standards say? And uh, Barton and I in some communities like Milburn and Montclair have actually created three ring binders for the Historic Preservation Commissioners so that they have right in front of them during a meeting, the references to all this information Barton is talking about today. Not all of it, but you know, the standards and the guidelines and preservation briefs. And then as time goes, you can always add to it with the article he mentioned from the uh, League of Municipalities 
or an inf or a interesting graphic about insulation. So my, my point is, uh, is I'd like people to not feel this is all just a matter of judgment and taste. This is a matter of standards and guidelines and regulations. And Barton is so good at it. He just, it just comes out naturally. And he says, I like, <laughs> but he's always using these standards when he says that. That's a great point. And thanks, thanks Peter for, for drilling that home. I think that's, a, that's important to remember. Um, next in the chat um, from Red Bank, um, I would like to find some examples of adding handicap access to a historic landmark. Can you point out anything in New Jersey? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's a really good standard. Obviously, there's the preservation uh, briefs, which are a good place for National Park Service. Um, what, what I find with the handicap stuff is it, it's really site specific. Um, you know, you especially when you're trying to do something innovative, you know, you don't want something off the shelf that you just kind of slap onto a historic building. You usually try to integrate it with the architecture of the building. Um, we even run into issues, you know, because you don't want to uh, discriminate against people using the front door, you know, how do you use the side or, or back door, but still make it seem like a, you know, a, a front entrance. So you're not discriminating against people um, with handicaps. So it, it really ends up being very site specific or property specific using the right materials. Like, you know, is it a wood ramp? Is it, you know, a, you know, a concrete ramp with a brick, you know, brick siding on it to kind of mimic whatever brick you already have on the building. Um, obviously if it's a government building, you have to go through the appropriate uh, review processes with National Park Service or Historic Preservation Office. Um, so yeah, it's, that's a tough one. That's that's why you hire a historic architect who, who knows what they're doing and to try to help you. But yeah, uh, and that's a very good question. That's a great question. And we did have a session a couple weeks ago on accessibility and preservation. And I believe I can't keep, I can't remember, but I believe Nicole Bellalon, our our speaker, uh, spoke to some examples. Um, and we're waiting for her to, um, uh, she's, she's putting captions on our video um, of that session, but when it goes out, it'll be online as well. Um, okay, Taylor Henry uh, asks, at towns closer to the ocean, do you find that historic materials break down sooner? It seems the climate makes preservation harder or replacement more frequent. Yeah, shore communities, uh, especially with wood, it, it definitely seems you're repainting more often. Um, that's where, you know, if you're going to use sympathetic composite materials, but you at least try to field paint it or something, I think they do last longer in those type of harsh environments. Uh, or like the H, B, and G, uh, you know, columns, uh, you know, especially if it's the same look, it's not some kind of a real unique uh, carpenter who would put them in in the first place. And it's something, you know, like an easy Doric or Tuscan or, uh, you know, Corinthian column, I, they do hold up better, um, you know, and I think that that's okay, you know, in those places where, you, you, you know, it's a different uh, weather pattern. So, you know, again, that's, that's why we have specific design guidelines for, for every municipality and there's not like a one size fits all. So that's something definitely each town, especially short communities should, um, you know, kind of investigate and, and see how many uh, synthetic materials they'll allow without compromising, you know, your historic, usually wood appearance. Great. Okay. And then the other questions that look like it's about, um, looks like the community is kind of answering for each other, which is fantastic. Um, and we will, again, we will share this presentation out. Um, before we close for today, oh, hold on. Do we get one more question? Oh, well, this, yes, this will be online. Yep. Um, it will be online probably within, I would say, give me until probably next Monday to get it online. And then it's preservationnj.org slash events slash events. And that's where you can find all of our, all of our presentations that we've done this past year. It's over, over 10 um, are all up there online. So I'm going to share my screen and just bring you to, through a couple of the, the last, the last slides before we close. Okay. Well, and first of all, I just want to say thank you to Barton. He was, uh, this was incredible. It was so packed with information. Um, I think everyone I'm sure is leaving with some good ideas um, and, and to bring back hopefully for their HPCs. And I see one person actually sitting in the room with, with a several people. Um, so maybe that an HPC is actually listening to this live, which is fantastic. Um, we have a couple events coming up that I want to just make you aware of our annual meeting. Uh, if you want to learn just more about our organization and what we've been up to this past year, some of our plans for 2021. 
will be um, on April 17th at 11. It will also have a kind of a fun component to that meeting, which is a behind the scenes tour of a former Tenmos, the Kruger Scott Mansion. We also will have our famed Tenmos Endangered Historic Places announcement coming up on Tuesday, May 18th. So definitely please uh, kind of keep your eyes open for details related to that. Um, that is, we'll have more details shortly. And please become a member. This is such a great group we have today. It's a really great community we have at Preservation New Jersey. We're looking to do some more in-person networking events now that it's uh, becoming more safe to do so in 2021. So we hope that you kind of come out and we can meet each other uh, in real life at some of the things we're planning. Um, and always stay in touch with us. This is our website, our social, our info, our phone number. Um, we, you know, we really look forward to connecting with you. And again, just want to thank our board president, Barton, for such a great presentation today. It was really uh, helpful, I think, for, for me. <laughs> I think I'm sure for everybody. So good round of applause. <laughs> Wonderful. So th thank you all. Th thank you all for tuning in. And we look forward to seeing you hopefully at some of our upcoming events. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.